My captain is dead. Tell King Manuel that the red blood of Francisco de Almeida, conqueror of the Indies, stains a white beach at the edge of his empire. At the braving Spanish knights, Berber horsemen, and Indian elephants. It was the king's lost faith. The devoted servant took his life's breath. Lies, they whispered in our king's ear. They called Don Francisco mad with lust for power, riches, and glory. Those jackals. Those who had never set foot on a swaying caravel in a monsoon, or felt the heat of the African sun sting upon a reddened neck. Was not my captain's devotion measured in the sweat and blood he poured across three continents and three oceans? I was a boy in the battlefield of Toro, birthed the legend of Don Francisco. While the last of the Moors held in Granada, the Christian kingdoms of Iberia warred for the throne of Castile. King Henry had died, leaving his kingdom to his daughter Juana, wife of King Alfonso of Portugal. The union of the two lands was celebrated in our country, but for the ambition of a queen, it was not to be. Queen Juana's 25-year-old aunt, Isabella, sought the throne for herself. Her powerful husband, the King of Aragon, led his army into Castile to seize the crown for his wife and unite that kingdom with his own. The armies of Aragon and Portugal met in the city of Toro to decide the fate of the free kingdom. Despite the successes of Don Francisco and Prince Juan, the Battle of Toro was indecisive. After three more years of war, a compromise was reached. Isabella was crowned Queen of Castile, joining that kingdom with Aragon into a unified Spain. In exchange, the wise King Alfonso, attuned to the changing times, received Spanish assurances that the African coast and the waters and lands to the east were a Portuguese dominion. I began my journey with Don Francisco two decades ago in Morocco. Thirteen years had passed since the Battle of Toro, and the grizzled soldier had risen to be an esteemed counselor to King Juan. Courtly life did not suit my captain well, however. He convinced the king to send him to Africa to fight the Moors. King Alfonso had conquered the Tangier coast before the war with Aragon. But Portugal's hold on Muslim Africa was tenuous. Barbary pirates menaced the coast, and Berber tribesmen emerged from the lifeless deserts in fierce raids. Against these predators stood a fragile outpost of Christendom on an island in the Lucos River. The garrison was led by a soldier named Afonso de Albuquerque whose path would cross with ours again in a different world. My captain set sail to take command of this garrison and re-establish Portugal's hold on Tangier. It would not be the last time that Dom Francisco carried the flag of Portugal to the dangerous edges of the Christian world. While we fought the centuries-old war against the Moors in North Africa, other sons of Portugal were the pioneers of a new age. On small, leaky caravels, they took the first daring steps from Europe and lifted the shroud that had obscured our understanding of the wider world for a millennium. The world was vast. Far vaster than we had ever imagined. 
but men like Bartolomeo Diaz and Vasco de Gama reached distant shores and gave us the first glimmers of a coming local empire. The Turks and Moors might flash their scimitars over the Mediterranean, but they wore no armor on their backs. There, in the Indian Ocean, an ancient trade flourished to the enrichment of the Muslim world. Armed with cannons and ships built to withstand the storms of the Atlantic, the sons of Portugal fall upon this world like a famished lion in the fold. It was five years ago that I went with Don Francisco to the Indies. His appointment to the viceroy ship of India by the young King Manuel had shocked the Portuguese court. Don Francisco was the champion of King Juan, the deceased cousin of the recently crowned king, and the Almeidas had favored a rival claimant to the Portuguese throne. The king's intentions were the topic of many hushed whispers. We sailed for many months across the edge of the world, preyed upon by pirates, storms, and disease. But as our leaky ships rounded the southern cape of Africa, we saw the first glimmers of the riches of the Orient. Three mighty citadels guarded the lucrative trade waters of the Swahili coast, where merchants traded ivory, gold, spices, and jewels from the innards of Africa to the fringes of faraway China. Weathered by the long voyage, Don Francisco sought trade and hospitality from the first of these citadels, but her stubborn ruler a usurper who had slain the rightful sultan arrogantly closed his gates to us. Finding an exiled African prince with ties to a rebel army, my captain cunningly hatched a plan to take the Swahili coast by fire and steel. Empires are built on the ruins of dead the pile of burnt stone we left in Mombasa, once a palace, was the foundation of the new empire of Portugal. Our conquest of the Swahili coast sent waves across the Indian Ocean to the wealthy trading cities of Zanzibar, Mogadishu, Calicut, and others. We were met with either fearful gifts or the closed gates of those with the foolishness to challenge our cannons. You would continue to make that mistake. After months at sea, we reached our goal, the rich Malabar coast of India, land of a thousand gods and a haven for spices, gold and silver. In the brackish lagoons of Kerala, among temples dedicated to strange serpent gods, we established our trading posts in the cities of Kananur and Cochin. From these cities, my captain and his son Lorenzo cunningly manipulated the feuding rajas and sultans. They maneuvered through the politics of spice and faith always with an eye for the most profitable outcome. One Hindu prince, however, defied us. This nameless ruler of Calicut, known only by the title the Zamorin, threatened to break the carefully crafted deals and rivalries from which Portugal profited. My sword and shrewd tongue Giving no credence to differences of religion or race, he gained allies in the Rajas, in the Sultans, and in rulers as far away as Egypt and Venice. 
Even our allies among the Indians fell for his intrigue. The treacherous Kolathiri Raja, Prince of Kananor, betrayed us for the Zamorin's gold. Surrounded by enemies, it seemed that the hands of fate had turned so quickly against us. Though the Zamorin limped away from Kananor bloodied, his resolve was untouched by our cannon. In driving men to war, gold can be more powerful than God. For centuries, the wealth of the Indies had passed through the Indian Ocean, carried by Arab, Indian, and Somali merchants to the port cities of Arabia. Egypt and Africa. From there, endless caravans carried wealth across the desert to Alexandria, and then to Istanbul, Venice, and Genoa. By rounding Africa, Portuguese traders had upset the traditional balance of this world. With our forts in India, we cut the trade that had enriched the Muslim sultans and Venetian doge alike. Don Francisco held a knife to the throats of our enemies. And as the lion fed, vultures and jackals appeared. We had taken the other side of the world by storm, but our own enemies followed. As the Zamorin beat his war drums, Ottomans and Egyptians rallied to him. Their ships were carried over the desert and rebuilt by treacherous Venetians. In India, an unlikely Russian renegade called Malik Ayaz raised the Muslim armies of Bukharat in defense of the Hindu Zamorin. Gold had truly become more powerful than as this coalition of Hindus, Muslims, and Christians descended on us, liars and jackals flocked to the court of King Manuel. They filled his ears with lies that Don Francisco had betrayed Portugal and convinced the young king to dispatch an armada led by Alfonso de Albuquerque to relieve my captain of the viceroy ship. Don Francisco, however, was in no mood for politics. Tragedy struck off the coast of Chaul. In a heroic naval battle, my captain's beloved son Lorenzo was slain by Amir Hussein, admiral of the Mamluk fleet of Egypt. Though he deeply loved his son, Don Francisco did not shed tears for his death. In repayment, my captain vowed to shed blood. With his son's death avenged, Don Francisco surrendered the viceroyship of India and wrote his final chapter. He would not return to his beloved Portugal. Landing in southern Africa to collect water, his party was ambushed by the Khoikhoi natives found his body on that forsaken white beach. In the five years since we departed Lisbon, we followed Don Francisco to the edge of the earth. We fought ebony-skinned warriors in the jungles and savannas of Africa, battled Mamluk sailors on the decks of galleys heaving in the monsoon waves, and struggled against armies of elephants and camels sprawling cities of India. Our caravels had taken us to the distant shores unknown to our ancestors and awoken Europe to a world beyond our dreams.